It's an honor to be here. Um, thank you to the organizers, the curators, fellow speakers, and to the Hakave in general. I'll start with an opening question um, that a lot of you have probably been asking yourselves. What is the atlas? Practically since its inception, Varberg's eclectic, eccentric assemblage of images, symbols, and gestures has been interpreted variously as a hermetic laboratory of cultural memory, uh, as a proto-cinematic work of montage, as a morphological archive of symbolic forms. But we should also remember that the same atlas that has been painstakingly reconstructed in this remarkable exhibition was itself the outgrowth of a series of exhibitions produced by the Warburg Library between 1926 and 1930. And you're looking at one from 1927, the um, Urworte Leidenschaftliche Gebärdensprache on Ovid. Now, the majority of these were designed to accompany, as you've heard, Warburg's famously long and improvised lectures, and they were conceived with a similarly scholarly audience in mind. But the Kabave did also produce two exhibitions intended for a general public. In 1927, after receiving an invitation to design a permanent display on the history of astrology at the Deutsches Museum in Munich, Warburg and his team assembled the Mach exhibition, Human Resemblance in the Cosmos, or Menschen Gleichnis am Himmel. The show never materialized because the Munich Museum found it too highbrow, uh, ironically, but after Warburg's death, Fritz Axel and Gertrude Bing uh, did fin finally realize it as the gallery of history of the history of astrology and astronomy at the Hamburg Planetarium, where it remained on display from 1930 until as late as 1941. In this talk, I want to propose that Nemuzune II, as heuristic and experimental as it is, can also be seen productively amongst such pedagogical exhibition projects. Like the many printed atlases of geography, anatomy, classical archeology span that proliferated throughout the 19th century in Europe, Warburg intended his atlas not only to illustrate, but also to instruct. To take a term from Walter Benjamin, Nemezune was an Übungsatlas, a kind of training manual for the visual cultivation of knowledge. In this respect, Many of its material as well as methodological foundations had already been laid by the didactic exhibitions of the late 1920s. The final version of the atlas literally absorbs entire panels from the previous exhibitions. And so panel B on the right uh, almost completely recycles a similar panel from the 1927 exhibition I just showed you. Thinking about the atlas as an exhibition can also place both its history and its aims into sharper relief. Warburg was, of course, no stranger to the didactic use of pictures, and as Eckhart Marchand will show in the next talk, he made use of his first display panels already in 1905 on the occasion of a pedagogical exhibit on Albrecht Dürer at the Hamburg Volksheim, a cultural center for the working classes. Here, I want to suggest that Mnemosyne also built upon a different precedent an older tradition of public exhibition that had nothing to do with aesthetic appreciation, but rather employed images as a means of popular enlightenment or Volksaufklärung. This tradition emerged within Wilhelmine Germany, and it worked to marry cultural history with scientific popularization, education with entertainment, visual communication with social welfare. Most importantly, these shows put forward new models for visual, the visual practice of cultural history, models that, I will argue, directly anticipate the Builder Atlas Nemezune. Two of these public pedagogical exhibitions bore an immediate relation on Warburg and his atlas. Uh, first, to the left, the International Hygiene Exhibition held in Dresden in 1911. Second, on the right, the International World Expo of the Book Trade and Graphic Arts in Leipzig in 1914. Both were curated by the same man, the historian of medicine, Karl Sudhoff, uh, 
a pioneering scholar whose work Warburg read closely, cited, and admired. This admiration may have been one of the reasons why Warburg agreed to contribute five photographs to Sudhoff's section at the Hygiene Exhibition. And in return, he would reuse many of the same images once displayed in Sudhoff's Leipzig Exhibition for his own unfinished atlas. But the relation does not end there. The exchange of materials and display methods between these two scholars points to an underlying intellectual conversation about the relationships between science, superstition, and historical progress. Karl Sudhoff's reputation as the Nestor of medical history is well earned. He occupied the first German, uh, tenured German professorship in that field, founded a preeminent journal, and as well as the Leipzig Research Institute uh, that still bears his name today. Sudhoff was trained as a literary scholar and steeped in the positivist methods of philology. However, his own working, his, his own writings and his exhibitions also advocated for what he called a medizinische Kulturgeschichte, a cultural history of medicine that would study images, instruments, and artifacts as historical sources in their own right. His curatorial activities in 1911 and 1914 represented perhaps the most radical realization of his cultural approach to the history of science and medicine and of his appreciation of visual and material culture. Zutoff's work in this domain, um, that's an image from Zutoff on the left, presents often astonishing parallels to Warburg's. And we'll come back to these images in the following. But a comparison between their respective projects also belies certain crucial differences that are not immediately obvious. Differences pertaining to fundamental understandings of images and their role in the human condition. My story belongs not in, uh, start again. My story begins not in Wilhelmine, Germany, but in 15th century Italy. At popular religious festivals, like the San Giovanni Fair, it was not uncommon to encounter the bizarre spectacle of men covered with live serpents orating to assembled crowds. These were not shamans or prophets, but salesmen hawking an antidote to snake poison known since antiquity as theriac. Their own ability to withstand the life-threatening danger posed by the snakes coiled around their bodies was visible evidence of what Warburg later called the immunity of the strong in faith, or the Immunität der Glaubensstarken. These theriac sellers claimed to be the Maltese descendants of St. Paul, who, according to legend, survived snake bite unharmed while shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Hence, in addition to theriac, these dudes were also selling pills made of Maltese earth, which they likewise ascribed, uh, to which they likewise ascribed miraculous immunizing properties. Barbrook had long been interested in these quack doctors and their magical medicines since the 1980s, in fact, when he first encountered uh, one depicted in a Florentine museum. They spoke to his interest in pagan ritual and the psychology of magic, and they surely evoked the specter of the Hopi serpent ritual that he had studied, albeit never seen firsthand. The Italian theriac vendors were still on his mind in 1910, when he was asked to contribute to the historical section of the International Hygiene Exhibition in Dresden. In his response, he proposed to send a, quote, cultural historical excursus on snake men from the Casa di San Paolo, end quote, along with photographs including an until now unrecognized representation of a theriac vendor. And these are some of the photographs that he did send. Uh, among and the, the exhibition organizers enthusiastically agreed to the suggestion, um, the, one, of the, one of the early modern artworks he included was this Florentine cassone, or wedding chest, made around 1420, upon which he had discovered that same figure of the theriac vendor here to the far left. 
He also sent a photograph of a tondo painted by Giulio Romano at the Palazzo del Te nearly two centuries later. It's a testament to Warburg's enduring fascination with the Theriac vendor that these same images comprise the focal point of his very last public lecture, which he gave at the Kunsthistorisches Institut in Florence on June 8, 1929. They also reappear in Atlas panel 2829, which may well have been produced initially to illustrate that same lecture. Sheer speculation, but I don't know. In his final talk, he discussed the figure both as a testament to everyday Florentine life, as well as a visual vehicle for the transmission of classical antiquity. The 15th century Cassone showed how life in motion could be represented in the context of the late medieval festival. Meanwhile, Giulio Romano's 17th century fresco rendered something quite different. Warburg praised, quote, the Laocoon-like appearance of one of those survivors of the ancient cult of Asclepius who, twined about with serpents, hawked his dubious wares around the country, end quote. If the Theriac vendor represented a survival of the pagan past in the Christian present, it was only with Romano's depiction that this, quote, antique content regained its antique form. In his correspondence with the Dresden Hygiene Exhibition organizers nearly two decades earlier, Farbrook had subjected those same images to a radically different interpretation. Rather than analyzing the Theriac vendor as an antique pathos formal in late and medieval camouflage, he regarded this type of medical charlatan as an index of the conflict between science and superstition in the early modern period. He thus glossed his five photographs as a corpus of until now completely overlooked image documents on the developmental history of superstitious vaccine medicine, end quote. The main subject of his little journey by way of illustrations was the persistence of this type of the anti-toxicologist over the course of four centuries, from the 14th to the 17th. This is in his letters to the organizers of the hygiene exhibition. While the Theriac vendor may outwardly resemble the classical chemist, uh, chemist pharmacist, Warburg bitterly warned that, quote, the Middle Ages also transforms this art, i.e. pharmacy, into a superstitious kind of medical astrology or uh, iatomistic. The antitoxic idea of immunization, he concludes, sinks down into belief in sorcery. Warburg's cautionary cultural history of the Theriac vendor accorded well with the popular enlightenment mission of the Dresden Hygiene Exhibition. This massive event was the brainchild of one Carl August Lindner, an ambitious Saxon entrepreneur who had made his fortune marketing the mouthwash brand Odol, which I believe is still around today. In 1903, he had put his acumen for visual propaganda into the service of public health with an exhibition on uh, epidemic diseases and their treatment, or Volkskrankheiten und ihre Bekämpfung. With the hygiene exhibition years later, Lindner inflated that very successful synthesis of public science and health education to the proportions of a World's Fair. Attended by over five and a half million people, the Dresden Hygiene Exhibition boasted national pavilions, including China, Russia, and Brazil, and exotic attractions like a reconstructed Abyssinian village, a human zoo with live performers. Special interest pavilions also abounded, ranging from children's welfare and temperance societies to showcases on tropical hygiene and eugenics. The core of the hygiene exhibition, however, consisted of three main sections, the historical, scientific, and popular, and Lindner had recruited none other than Karl Zudhoff for the historical section, which was to be the entry point into the other two. Hence the question, what is hygiene, would be answered in terms of its historical becoming. As with every other scientific or practical activity of the human mind, wrote Zudhoff on the occasion of the exhibition, a complete understanding of every individual hygienic phenomenon requires knowledge of its emergence, its formation, and further development, end quote. The historical section would therefore unfold uh, through a combination of pictures, sculptures, and models 
the hygienic and unhygienic moments in the entire cultural development of humanity. That's taking it a bit far, but this, um, this exhibition was structured as a sort of journey through the history of civilization, which it conceived in broadly Eurocentric terms. Uh, you would begin with Egyptian mummification and Jewish ritual hygiene practices onwards to the exemplary models of uh, classical Greek athletics, uh, as well as uh, Roman uh, aqueducts and the, uh, the thriving hammam culture of the medieval Islamic world, up to um, the early modern period and uh, plague containment in, uh, in medieval Europe. For Sutov, hygiene was everything that lay at the crossroads of preventative medicine and cultural history and encompassed architecture, nutrition, clothing, housing, bathing, exercise, waste management, burial, and so on. Varberg's images of theriac vendors, which he himself had labeled a, an episode from the history of magical hygiene, were placed, fittingly enough, in a section on fantastical hygiene and superstition, fantastische Hygiene und Aberglauben. The purpose of this room was to demonstrate the pernicious power of ideas over hygienic practice and the obstructive force of superstition uh, and prejudice against the push of scientific knowledge. As the exhibition guide cautioned the visitor, it takes merely one step from hanging an amulet to inoculate yourself against the evil eye to encouraging full-blown spiritual epidemics, geistige Seuchen, like self-flagellating mobs, witch trials, and murderous pogroms. The cautionary examples of superstitious medicine on display, including the theriac vendors, thus offered historical testimony to the omnipresent and recrudescent dangers of human unreason. And while we possess little documentation on how this room actually looked, uh, we can get a sense from the adjacent, uh, a photograph of the adjacent room, which dealt with early modern disease treatment. Now, having borrowed over 22,000 images and objects, many of which were for sale, the organizers clearly struggled with their limited display space, particularly in the rooms dedicated to more recent history. Images and artifacts were densely packed together and scarcely labeled. Sounds familiar. After visiting the exhibition in the summer of 1911, Farber complained that only one of his photographs had been put on display, and then with a label that mistook Peter for Paul. He nevertheless agreed to donate his five images to the collection of what would become two years later the Dresden Hygiene Museum. While they had had their formations in the history of art and medicine, respectively, Warburg and Sudhoff met on the common ground of cultural history. This was hardly something that could be taken for granted at the time, since Kulturgeschichte in turn of the century Germany represented nothing less than a methodological revolt against the dominant historiographical school. The tradition of political history associated with Leopold von Ranke treated the state as the true subject of knowledge and great men as the agents of historical change. Cultural history, on the other hand, oriented itself around the masses rather than individuals, prioritized customs and mentalities over political events. And perhaps most importantly for our purposes, cultural history worked to legitimate the use of images and other nonverbal sources as historical documents. After all, pictures testify to a broader range of social practice and belief than the merely textual discourses of landed elites. Not only did images enlarge the scope of historical inquiry, but like seismographs, they even seemed to register the collective psychological undercurrents that bound together past, present, and future. At the University of Leipzig, Sudhoff was colleagues with the most controversial cultural historian of his generation, Karl Lamprecht, who incidentally had been one of Warburg's most influential teachers. Lamprecht took a leading role in organizing the International World Expo of the Book Trade and Graphic Arts, which opened in the city in March 1914, attracting 2.3 million visitors before the abrupt outbreak of the First World War, 
The book trade exhibition was billed as an exhibition of world cultures, very fitting. Uh, much like its predecessor in Dresden, it constituted a distinctly asymmetrical microcosm of a rapidly globalizing world with numerous national pavilions, colonial dioramas, and even a recreation of old Istanbul where visitors could watch dervishes and harem dancers while sipping their complimentary mochas. At the center of this grand exhibition, however, was Lamprecht's so-called Hall of Culture, which included, under its auspices, a comparative exhibition of world art, an ethnographic division, and last but not least, the scientific section, curated by Zuthoff. Entitled 3,000 Years of Graphic Arts in the Service of Science, Zuthoff's 1914 exhibition illustrated the evolution of visual representation in the natural sciences across Europe, the Near East, and Asia from prehistory to the end of the 17th century. Due to constraints of both time and space, the rooms were arranged not chronologically, but according to different scientific disciplines, such as, uh, such as uh, zoology, zoo zoology, astronomy, chemistry, physics, medicine, and botany and anatomy. Now, looking at these cluttered collages of black and white photographs, we might well be reminded of Mnemosyne. And in point of fact, this outward resemblance indicates not only the material continuities between Sudhoff's show and Varberg's atlas, but also their common intellectual preoccupation with the cultural history of scientific knowledge, as well as its troubling inversion, superstition, and magic. Consider this room dedicated to the history of medicine, where among other things, numerous images were assembled of Babylonian and Etruscan bronze liver models used for augury. Many of the same images reappear in panel one of the atlas, here to the right, which thematizes the cosmological correspondences that gave this type of fortune telling its meaning. This divinatory practice rested upon a perceived magical connection between the organic body and the cosmos. And certain of these bronzes even assigned specific regions of the sacrificial liver to different astral deities. And this model from Piacenza, which Warburg includes on panel one, he describes the, this as a uh, transitional type between divination by entrails and mathematical cosmic speculation. But in contrast to the splintering lines of uh, influence outlined by the atlas, Sudhoff's display at the left simply offers us a sober inventory of bronze livers, equally chaotic in appearance perhaps, but neatly encapsulated in their own time. Like the Pythagorean prognostic diagrams next to them, to the far left here, uh, these implements of ancient magic are offered not as a point of departure for the development of science, but plainly presented as a thing of the past, a stage long since superseded in the slow ascent of scientific progress. At least three of the images from Sudhoff's display on astronomy in ancient Greece and Babylonia, here to the right, were reproduced in Atlas panel two, which takes its theme, uh, as its theme, the Hellenic cosmological imagination. The three photographs highlighted here reproduce a 9th century copy of an ancient zodiacal manuscript depicting Perseus rescuing Andromeda. Um, so the figures in red, blue, and yellow represent Andromeda, Cetus, and Cassiopeia, respectively. As Warburg knew quite well, of course, uh, the Greek power of, I quote, power of poetic and anthropomorphic visualization uh, which had grouped the stars into constellations, uh, almost always built on Near Eastern precedents. And Babylonian materials from Zuthoff's exhibition did not only recur in the Atlas, but also in the 1930 exhibition at the Hamburg Planetarium. Consider this uh, etching from a 12th century BCE boundary stone of Nebuchadnezzar, which depicts the arching centaur that eventually became the sign of Sagittarius, or this eighth century black marble boundary stone on loan from the Berlin Vorderasiatisches Museum, 
whose astrological embellishments up top include the familiar zodiacal symbol of the scorpion. In either case, Warburg and Sudhoff both present us with a relatively linear history of the genesis of ancient symbols, their continuity and change. My final example, however, illustrates how the, common form, uh, the, the formal commonalities between Zuthoff's and Warburg's exhibitions belied far-reaching conceptual differences. The previously mentioned panel B of the Atlas centers around the so-called zodiacal man, Tierkreis Mensch. Mediated through the 12 signs of the zodiac, this ancient figure linked together the microcosm of the human body with the ma macrocosm of celestial bodies. According to Warburg, such images symbolically incarnated the classical laws of harmony, expressing the reciprocal influences between man and universe. However, radiating out from the starting point, Warburg used his photographic montage to illustrate how man and, I quote, the astral symbol shrivel up in the post-classical Middle Ages into a dreary instrument of sympathetic magic, end quote. And using these same diagrams, in fact, uh, medieval barber surgeons applied the harmonic correspondences of ancient cosmography directly to the patient's body, bleeding them at the knee if the month was in Capricorn, and at the ankle if it was in Pisces. Karl Sudhoff, too, was interested in these images, but for different reasons. In 1914, he published a visual compendium of manuscripts on medieval surgery many of which he reproduced there for the first time, and many of which he also showed in his Leipzig exhibition on scientific images from the same year in a display dedicated to zodiacal and planetary men and women. That's, again, to the left. And there's a striking resemblance between this exhibition display and Warburg's own panel B, which, as you will remember, itself reiterates a panel from Warburg's own more pedagogical 1927 exhibition. Whether or not Warburg personally visited Sudhoff's exhibition, there's this, this sometimes staggering overlap testifies not only to the two scholars' exchange of materials and ideas, but also to the shared stakes in visualizing the cultural history of science and medicine, both its promise and the attendant dangers. To greater or lesser degrees, both scholars held up classical antiquity as a standard, treating the historical arc of Western civilization as a gradual triumph over medieval and Eastern magic by an emulative return towards ancient Greece. In either case, this is a fairly standard cautionary enlightenment narrative, but whereas Sudhoff's display practice could best be described as didactic, Warburg's perspective in the atlas became increasingly dialectical in nature. There, he strove not to enlighten the masses out of superstition, but to illustrate precisely the interpenetration of rational and magical thought. Panel B is a good case in point, for it does not simply stop with the superstitious surgeon's manuals, but shows how in the, in the 16th century and in the uh, images including Leonardo and the, the bottom row, the encircled zodiacal man metamorphoses yet again into Durer and Vasari's rationalistic studies of human proportion in the middle, uh, center, and to the right, but at the same time also in the, the, the occultist magic of Agrippa of Netesheim, in the bottom two images on the right. Warburg re rejected rationalist myths of linear development. Science and magic were two branches from the same trunk, and superstition a necessary complement to enlightenment. If his public exhibitions nonetheless tended towards a more straightforwardly didactic mode, the more private and heuristic arena of the atlas almost always problematized progressive visions of history. Hence, it's fundamentally fragmentary, agonistic, sometimes agonizing, and unresolved vision of that history. By contrast with Zuthoff's cataloging style, we see in the atlas a, a, a collage format tracing historical survivals into the present day, enfolding also contemporary sources, 
which is quite unlike Sudhoff, into the long array of the Selbsterziehung der Menschheit, the self-education of humanity. So what bound them together, ultimately? By inquiring into the hidden and maligned sources of cultural history, Sudhoff felt that the, quote, historian of hygiene was in the same position as the modern historian of art, end quote. Yet the medical historian addressed images mostly as auxiliary instruments of scientific knowledge, preoccupied particularly with the development of verisimilitude. This impacted his opinion of photography as well, which, as we've seen, comprised the primary method of both of his exhibitions. Only, only photography, that self-triggering photochemical process, could liberate images from the taint of subjectivity. Yet, by using photographic reproductions of artistic images, as in this display on uh, quote-unquote artistic anatomy, Sudhoff nonetheless demonstrated that, uh, to use Sandra Gilman's words, even subjective images could form the stuff of objective history. For his part, Varberg's shifting attitudes towards photography closely match with the changing aims of his scholarship. Writing in 1907 about the pedagogical exhibitions of Dürer and Rembrandt at the Hamburg Volksheim, he summarily dismissed the use of photography as a surrogate, as adulterated food, and a systematic obstruction of the emergence of an independent and informed interest in art. Over time, however, his emphasis on art appreciation uh, turned into an iconological pursuit of cultural history, consonant with the public enlightenment methods of Sudhoff's exhibitions. But rather than considering images as the medical historian did, merely as novel sources of history, Warburg treated them as active agents of that history. Images can collapse the mental distance between cause and effect, as we've seen with the Babylonian livers and astrological surgical diagrams, but they can also generate new spaces of reflection in turn. By way of conclusion, I'd like to return to the example of the theriac vendors which, with which we began. At multiple points in his writings, Warburg spoke of the reception of classical antiquity itself as a process of aesthetische Entgiftung, aesthetic detoxification, the sublimation and rationalization of the destructive forces of human irrationality. Giulio Romano had aesthetically detoxified the theriac vendor, for instance, rendering him as a placative latter-day Laocon and a survivor of the cult of Asclepius, the Redeemer. And thus, too, did Warburg imagine certain hallucinatory affinities between the theriac vendors of Renaissance Italy and the Pueblos of turn-of-the-century New Mexico and Arizona, both of whom manipulate poisonous snakes in ritual manifestations of supernaturally ordained immunity. It was no accident that the serpent in Warburg's Anthropology of Images was one of the most potent symbols of the inner and outer demoniac forces that humanity most must overcome. That's a quote from Warburg, as you might have guessed. Yet like Theriac itself, a venom antidote produced from snake's flesh, images and symbols can also immunize us to the very dangers they carry within them as so often the poison is also the cure. In a similar sense, Farber once professed that he could only approach the goal of understanding, enlightenment, and law in the workings of cultural history by including irrational instinct within the ambit of historical investigation." End quote. It is for this reason that despite his debts to Sudhoff's exhibitions and his example, the complex and contradictory vision of cultural history realized in the Mnemosyne Atlas decisively parts ways with this tradition of popular scientific enlightenment. Before the First World War, perhaps the good European could still keep his faith in the laborious and hard-won achievements of universal reason. But in the throes of inflation in 1929, Warburg fresh out of the sanatorium, came to grips with, like few others, with the per perpetual perils of madness and mass violence. The atlas was his antitoxin. While it richly took up the techniques of Volksaufklärung, this 
visual exposition of Kulturgeschichte, of science and superstition, ultimately pointed towards a more disturbing kind of enlightenment, towards one that he called, I quote, the devastating truth that unchained elemental man is the unconquerable ruler of this world, end quote. Thank you. <laughs>